It's pretty hard to piss me off, I'm a restrained and balanced man. But when it comes to my personal life, I can't vouch for myself here. My wife's lover came up to me at an event, came up to me, and told me right to my face that he really liked my wife, especially in bed. There was no limit to my anger. Leave, I detest you so much, you vile woman. Those were the final words I uttered to my wife, Cindy, the woman I had cherished for seven years before our brief encounter at the divorce court several months later. But that's a story for another time. I never imagined our relationship would unravel like this. We seemed destined to be together forever. Seven years may not seem like much, but we appeared to be the perfect couple. I never once doubted her loyalty, until the moment I realized what a fool I had been. She shamelessly cheated with an actor while we were all attending an award ceremony in Cannes, south of France. She was employed at a prestigious agency that represented top-tier actors. It was there among my friends that the path to her temptation and the downfall of our marriage unfolded. Why they thought it wise to include me in their Mediterranean escapade is beyond comprehension. Perhaps they felt entitled, assuming I would simply acquiesce to whatever was presented to me. They were mistaken. I won't dignify the despicable individual who seduced her and labeled her as his conquest. Why not? Because certain individuals have compensated me generously to keep their secret to shield him, and to remove her from my life with financial gain as the sole consolation. She has relinquished all claims to our shared assets, presumably compensated by either the scoundrel himself or her employer at the agency. Whether she suffers consequences is of no concern to me, the deceitful traitor. I have to mention this individual to recount the story, but I'll refer to him as Tim. Are you familiar with any well-known actors named Tim? No, neither am I, so Tim it is. My apologies to any lesser-known Tims who might take offense at not being recognized. A mere $5 million offered to me to sign a non-disclosure agreement, along with getting rid of her and without any impact on our assets, seemed like a good deal. Sure, there was a personal toll, but having five million reasons to be practical outweighed it. I was already financially secure, but the prospect of such a large sum, discreetly deposited offshore, was too tempting to pass up, especially since I was determined to end things with her, even if it meant relinquishing over half of our assets. As for me, I'm Jeff, Jeff Smithers, and I'm a very frustrated soon-to-be single man, although I wasn't aware of it yet at the start of this story, still part of Jeff and Cindy. What I despise is being deceived and realizing how I've been taken for a fool. I'm the proprietor of my consulting business, which has been a labor of passion. Over the span of a decade, I've painstakingly built it from the ground up. It's thriving, financing the majority of Cindy's and my lifestyle. Anticipating potential challenges, I ensured Cindy signed a prenuptial agreement, safeguarding the business from being considered communal property in our marriage which thankfully proved wise, although she would have had to waive that as well. With a strong clientele base and numerous ongoing contracts with major corporations, my professional future is secure. However, the issue lies with Cindy. Initially captivating, she held my heart entirely and I believed we were an ideal couple. Yet she betrayed me by engaging in infidelity, perhaps enticed by the allure of someone famous. What an infuriatingly cliched scenario. Cindy was and still is stunning. I used to believe her beauty was both internal and external, but it's astonishing how love can blind a person. We were both 29 years old, married for seven years after dating for two. She had been working at the agency for eight years and had risen to a position where she was heavily involved with some of our largest clients, particularly Tim. Had I not been so deeply in love and trusting, I might have noticed the warning signs. When she was informed that she would be working with Tim, she was overjoyed. She spoke of feeling honored and described him as handsome and genuinely kind. These were all signs of infatuation, but I was too trusting to see the danger. She was asked to accompany Tim on a tour of TV networks to promote his latest movie. Although her long absences, sometimes a week here, 10 days there, and even an 18-day trip across major European capitals, worried me I didn't want to dampen her excitement. I was genuinely happy for her. Cindy adored her job, 
especially the opportunity to mingle with famous personalities. Little did I know my marriage was on the brink of collapse. A few months later, she still overflowed with the thrill of her travels and the stardust arriving home one night bursting with news. Jeff, I received some incredible news today. Tim's film has been nominated for an award at the Cannes Film Festival, and I'll be part of the entourage attending. I'm thrilled to be involved, and I'll even be at the award ceremony. My agency is generously providing a budget for evening gowns for the ceremony and parties. Her expression dimmed slightly at my subdued reaction. I believed I had been reasonable considering the extensive travel she had already undertaken for the publicity tour. My response was a simple, Oh. What's the matter, Jeff? I thought you'd be happy for me landing this opportunity, she said with a hint of sadness. But nothing could dampen her spirits. Cindy, it's just that I missed you so much during your publicity tour. Being apart from you for over three months, especially those several weeks, was tough, I explained. But I understand it's part of your job and I know how much you wanted it. I let my words hang in the air before continuing. I just hope that you'll have some time for your husband after all this. Cindy seemed a bit hurt by my remark. She looked like she wanted to argue, but remained silent. The absence of any objection from her initially made me wonder if there was more going on than I realized. However, my suspicion was short-lived as she surprised me the following day by informing me that the agency would cover my travel expenses as a token of appreciation for the time I had allowed her to be away from home over the past few months. She mentioned it would entail a two-week trip with all expenses covered and top-notch accommodations, completely free for me if I could spare the time away from my business. Without hesitation, I agreed. A complimentary journey to France was an opportunity I couldn't resist. I adjusted a few appointments, arranged to work remotely with some clients, and made the necessary arrangements to clear my schedule. If I had known then what I know now, I would have gladly stayed home, but I would have still believed I had a faithful wife. Every dark cloud has a silver lining, even if it feels like a terrible situation at the time. And so we embarked on a journey to France, specifically to the stunning town of Cannes, on the French Riviera, situated along the coast from Monaco and the bustling city of Nice. The festival typically takes place in May and spans 11 or 12 days. We were accommodated in a luxurious five-star hotel with a suite overlooking the renowned Plage du Midi, where famous, particularly beautiful actresses are often photographed against the backdrop of the Bay of Cannes. I anticipated Cindy's active participation within the group, leveraging the publicity to the fullest. As the most attractive female member, alongside a well-known actress, she would serve as occasional eye-catching appeal in the press photos. While I had online work to attend to, much of the time felt like vacation as I entertained myself. My interactions with Cindy were brief, and I wasn't particularly worried. I presumed her admiration for Tim, which she expressed, stemmed from being with a celebrity, but ultimately it was just part of her job. My initial moment of genuine concern arose when she returned to the suite to prepare for what was supposed to be an afternoon of publicity photo shoots on the beach. Essentially, she was meant to serve as a decorative addition to the main actors. We had been there for five days, and everything had been proceeding as usual. When she came out of the bathroom, she was wearing what I'm afraid to call clothes. In fact, it looked like nothing more than a few strands of dental floss strung on top of each other and barely covering anything. The only thing covering her was a small piece of cloth. Although the material was partially opaque, it was obvious that if it got wet, it would show everything she had to offer. I was taken aback. I had never witnessed it before. What on earth is that, Cindy? You're not seriously going out in public dressed like that, are you? I exclaimed in disbelief. Where did you get that? It's a gift from Tim. He said it would make the press photos sizzle. It's part of my job here, Jeff. Please don't blow it out of proportion, she responded, looking somewhat ashamed but showing no intention of changing. Damn it, Cindy, I don't want half of France, let alone our friends at home, to see you in that outfit. You look like an adult film actress, I blurted out before I fully thought about my words. After my remark, she angrily grabbed something and ran out.
I decided to leave her alone, focused on my work, and ordered a simple lunch to our room through the room service. I enjoyed dinner on a small terrace overlooking Midi Beach and happened to notice Cindy and her company happily posing for numerous photographers, both professionals and amateurs. From our terrace, located about 30 meters away from us, everything that was happening there was clearly visible, but the view of my wife was the most provocative. It was also obvious that she rarely strayed far from Tim. I observed several instances of him wrapping his arm around her waist, which made me uncomfortable to witness, although it wasn't necessarily indicative of anything inappropriate. Despite my discomfort, I continued to observe as the photo shoot concluded with a few, including Cindy and Tim, heading towards the sea, while others made their way back to the hotel. The distance from the embankment to the sea was small, which allowed me to easily observe what was happening from my observation post. Again, nothing suspicious was noticeable, but eventually, after they were in the water, I noticed that she was walking back along the beach and his arm was still around her waist the whole time. I wasn't pleased with what I observed. It seemed reminiscent of what one would expect from lovers and fell short of meeting the standards of a loyal husband. For the first time, I felt genuine concern about my marriage. My mood didn't lighten when she returned to the room after another 45 minutes. She appeared completely innocent, as though she couldn't possibly be guilty of anything. I furrowed my brow and shrugged. What's the matter? She asked, looking puzzled by my reaction. What's wrong? I looked at her meaningfully. My gaze was riveted on her appearance and what I had observed recently. Well, I began, let me outline the problem in general terms. First of all, your body is quite clearly on display to the whole of France in this, whatever you want to call it. Obviously, the entire population can observe my wife's figure as a whole. Then, she interrupted me by saying, Don't be so tense, Jeff. This is Europe. No one here is worried about this. No one cares. Besides, I thought it might please you. We've been apart for so long this year that I decided to wear this for you. I stood by my opinion. Cindy, Tim bought this for you. You wear this for him, or at best for work, not for me. Besides, I saw you and Tim walking along the beach. He was hugging you all the time, hugging you to him. And as if that wasn't enough, you returned to the hotel 45 minutes before you came here. Where have you been? Once more, she blushed with decency before replying. What exactly are you implying, Jeff? What accusations are you making against me? You understand that this is purely professional, don't you? Jeff, I'm simply fulfilling my responsibilities, yes. Tim may be attractive, but that's where it ends. There's nothing more to it. Darling, I'm focused on my work. I chose to hold my tongue. I supposed her explanation was plausible, but it was evident she had spent considerable time with Tim, and their comfort around each other was obvious. Was she exceptionally skilled at her job? She mentioned the possibility of a substantial bonus for her management of Team Tim's affairs. This event marked the culmination of the movie project, and perhaps in a month, I'd regret ever doubting her. So the following day marked a significant moment. It was the evening when the inaugural award ceremony for his film commenced. I wasn't there as an official attendee. I was merely an extra, with no role or involvement in the main events. Cindy looked stunning in her glamorous gown, and my heart raced as she departed for the event. I knew there was a high probability she would be seated next to Tim. I prayed that my heart wouldn't soon be shattered. The festival received extensive coverage on French television, so it didn't take long for me to confirm that Cindy wasn't just seated next to Tim, but also appeared to be leaning towards him. My worries only intensified. Tim ended up winning an award, and I received a text inviting me to the after-party. That's when everything went downhill. It began decently enough, with a few drinks escalating into many. As midnight neared, some began to disperse, and I noticed Cindy heading towards the restroom. To my surprise, Tim approached me for the first time. We'd never conversed before, and I doubted we shared any common ground. Yet, with his opening remark, I realized we did have something in common, sleeping with my wife. Hi, Jeff. You have an amazing wife. You're a lucky guy. You're very lucky. She's been the only one helping me relax for the last few months. Thank you, bro, he said. 
and clearly, he'd had too much alcohol because how else can you explain this prank? I felt a strong desire to confront him physically. I'm a big guy, probably 25 pounds heavier and 3 inches taller, and I was seething with anger. However, I wanted to hear more about it, so it was with great difficulty that I managed to ask him, Interesting, Tim. How long have you been spending time together like this? I kept a sober look while he was obviously drunk and enjoying his bragging rights. Oh, soon after we started the promotional tour, he boasted, I'm sure I've been in bed with her maybe 30 times. Oh man, you'd know what she's doing. You'd obviously envy me. I'm not sure she even tried it when either, and probably wouldn't have tried if it wasn't for me. So you still owe me. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that she was approaching, but I chose not to pay attention to her, hoping that she would hear what we were going to talk about next. Tim didn't notice her presence, so I turned to him. Okay, Tim, thanks for telling me that my wife is just another promiscuous woman. Don't you want to get rid of her? Her expression changed when she heard my question, and she burst into tears when she heard his answer. No way, buddy. You can keep it for yourself. I can find a woman like your wife anywhere, anytime. She is good as a woman, but nothing more. Why would I be interested in a woman like her? No, buddy, you're in charge of her, but thanks for lending me the time. She's good for a few meetings, but nothing more. I could hear her sobbing, repeating, No, 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 it shouldn't be like that, when I glanced at her and shook my head. Then turning back to Tim, I said, Well, I don't need her either. And then I hit him once, causing him to fall to the ground. Shortly after, the local police handcuffed me and took me away. Looking back, I noticed that Cindy was helping Tim up, seeking medical attention for his obviously damaged nose. How gentle it won't affect his appearance in any way, which suits me fine. As the aggrieved husband, I ended up punching him and knocking him down, but ended up getting myself arrested. The police couldn't have members of the public attacking famous actors, the issue for me was that I didn't speak French, but they provided an interpreter and the police questioned me in his presence. This occurred at 9 a.m. after I had spent a night in the cell. Through the interpreter, the police inquired about the incident that led me to assault a famous actor. I declined to answer and requested to speak with a lawyer before responding to any questions. They acknowledged my right to legal representation and returned me to the cell to await contact with a lawyer. Approximately an hour later, I was informed that my wife had arrived to see me, but I firmly declined any conversation with her. It was reminiscent of a scene from the Pink Panther movies with a Frenchman's nasal, hon hon ha, and suddenly they seemed to grasp the issue. They relayed to Cindy that I refused to speak with her and requested her departure. Shortly after, a police officer brought me coffee and a croissant, gesturing understandingly and sympathetically with a touch to his nose, exclaiming, Ah, mon Dieu, mon ami, les femmes, oh là là. Around 30 minutes later, two events occurred nearly simultaneously. A French attorney named Monsieur Philippe Leblanc was ushered in to meet me, while a representative from Cindy's agency also sought contact. Monsieur Leblanc proposed that we listen to the agency's proposition, and after some negotiation with the police, we arranged to meet privately. I consented eager for assistance in my situation and an update on Tim's intentions. The agency had sent their second-in-command to speak with me, Peter Longstaff, a name I couldn't help but find amusingly fitting for a certain object. Despite my initial amusement, I had encountered Peter briefly at a few company gatherings and he had struck me as a decent individual. I waited for him to initiate the conversation. What a chaotic situation, Jeff. Did you have any inkling that something was going on between them? Peter inquired. I shook my head in denial. Not a clue until I spotted them together on the beach yesterday, Peter. I never imagined she would do such a thing. I thought our relationship was solid. Did your team have any knowledge of this? I'll be frank, Jeff, because I sympathize with you. Some individuals within our circles had suspicions, but it wasn't until very late in the game, just before this whole mess unfolded. Off the record and speaking strictly on a personal level, I'm genuinely sorry, Jeff. I did witness your altercation and I have to admit, again, off the record, I couldn't help but chuckle when you put him on the ground. He could use a lesson in humility, Peter remarked with a smile. Yes, Peter was indeed a good person. 
Jeff, do you have any plans for what you'd like to happen in an ideal scenario? Yeah. I wish I could just eliminate them both and move forward, but I know that's unlikely anytime soon. What's your plan regarding Cindy? Can you patch things up with her? No way, Peter. I'm going to divorce her and do whatever it takes to bring both her and him down. Peter, I don't have any issues with you, but I'm pretty sure a good lawyer back home will handle this for me. If they suggest holding the agency accountable, then so be it. The agency can't escape some responsibility in this, you understand? Peter looked at me and responded, All right, Jeff, that's what I expected. We all have our own interests here. You need to leave, and we need to keep this under wraps. Tim doesn't want any more people to know he got beat up. He's supposed to be an action hero, for God's sake. He continued, saying, Since he's not filing charges, there won't be any prosecution. The local politicians are keen on keeping their festival untarnished, so you're off the hook. You can inform your lawyer friend he's no longer necessary, all right? The lawyer departed with a brief handshake, assured by Peter that the agency would cover his fees upon receipt of an emailed bill to the address on Peter's business card. Now, Jeff, let's get down to business. Are you set on divorce? No chance of reconciliation? I understand if you are, but I want you to know that she still cares for you deeply. She just got lost in an infatuation with a famous actor. Trust me, she'll be heartbroken. I truly wish she suffers for it, Peter. Right now I despise her completely. She showered that arrogant jerk with everything she had to offer. If what he boasted to me is accurate, he received favors from her that I never did. Her intimacy, for starters, and much more. I had mentioned it to her occasionally over the years, but no, then she gives herself to that jerk. All right, I understand your point, Jeff. I'll pressure her to provide you with everything you need in the divorce. We'll ensure she realizes she'll face disgrace and unemployment if she doesn't comply. Jeff, I'll also propose to the board that they compensate you generously in exchange for your silence about the entire situation. With your consent, Jeff, I'm arranging for your departure and booking you on the next flight back home. Is that acceptable to you? I nodded in agreement as he went on. Please trust me, Jeff. I'll ensure that you emerge from this situation as well as possible. I apologize, I know it sounds cliché, but I mean it sincerely. I give you my word. Although we're not very familiar with each other, I consider myself a man of integrity. Before you leave, Jeff, Cindy asked me to implore you to speak with her. She's unaware of my plans, but could you please have a conversation with her before you depart this evening? Peter, you're the hero in all of this. But could you promise me one thing? Will you convey these exact words to her? He nodded in agreement. Tell her she's a reprehensible, deceitful person, and I never want to see her again. Never. I'm truly sorry it's come to this, but yes, I'll relay your message to her verbatim. She'll react just as you anticipate. She'll be devastated. But Jeff, she only has herself to blame. I'll reach out to you when we return next week, and I'll present you with the best offer I can negotiate from the board. I'll also convince Cindy that she has no alternative but to comply. I'll arrange for your release, take you back to the hotel, ensure she's not in your suite upon arrival, and personally escort you to the airport for the earliest flight home. In just over 15 hours, my marriage imploded. I was consumed by pure anger and hatred towards both Cindy and that jerk Tim for what they did to me. Within another 15 hours, I found myself back home, feeling the emptiness in both my body and my house without Cindy. I knew our relationship was irreparable. I couldn't bear to stay here surrounded by memories. I planned to hit her hard in the divorce, ensuring she couldn't afford the rent. One of my first tasks was to inform the landlord that we'd be vacating. Knowing Cindy would be in France for another week gave me ample time to handle banking matters, savings, checking accounts, credit, and debit cards. Keeping busy with these tasks helped distract me from the pain of betrayal and allowed me to focus on my priorities in the divorce. Despite Peter Longstaff's reputation as a nice guy, I needed to ensure the outcome favored me. Time passed and before long I received a call from Peter expressing his desire to meet and discuss matters. He mentioned that he, along with a lawyer representing the board, wished to facilitate a swift and uncontested divorce. We convened in my office where Peter introduced the lawyer accompanying him, a pleasant woman named Jeannie O'Battle, 
whom I whimsically dubbed Genie in the Bottle in my thoughts. Despite my initial jest, it became evident that Genie from the law firm Sue, Grabbit, and Rune possessed a keen intellect and bore no resemblance to any cartoon character. Her sharpness of mind was unmistakable. Mr. Smithers, I want to convey on behalf of the agency involved in this agreement or negotiation our sincere apologies for our role in the breakdown of your marriage. I've been given the authority to extend a substantial offer to you, contingent upon your agreement, to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Essentially, they're offering you compensation. I understand Peter may have hinted at something similar before, so here's a preliminary agreement. I know your father had legal expertise, so please have him or another representative review it. However, it's crucial to maintain absolute secrecy. Otherwise, all offers will be retracted, and your wife will face consequences, likely resulting in a contentious divorce. This isn't meant as a threat, but rather information you need to consider in your decision-making process. Peter has crafted a comprehensive package. Take your time to review it thoroughly and seek advice. But remember, confidentiality is paramount. Peter and I are available to address any concerns you may have today. I'm confident you'll find much of the offer satisfactory. Additionally, Mrs. Smithers is aware of her limited options and is willing to follow my advice with one condition. She requests one hour of communication with you. Frankly, I've told her it's futile as you have no interest in reconciling, but she insists. That's her condition, hoping to persuade you to consider a future together. I firmly expressed, oh, I know I refuse to see or speak to her anymore. I'm done. Peter, did you convey to her the exact message I instructed you to? Peter replied, yes, Jeff, I relayed your exact words. I told her you described her as a despicable, cheating individual and declared, you never want to see her again, ever. Jeff, she broke down in tears, just as you desired. However, I must inform you, Jeff, that I believe she may be in a state of severe delusion. She quietly muttered, We'll see about that, repeatedly, which concerns me deeply. Jeff glanced at Peter, his expression void, of any emotion. He no longer cared about Cindy. His anger had consumed him to the point where hate was his predominant emotion. He hadn't yet realized that hate isn't the antithesis of love, it's merely distorted love likely irreparably damaged but still smoldering. Despite the emptiness or disdain he felt, raw emotion still lingered within him. Jeff was on the verge of issuing a warning to her to cease her behavior, threatening to leave the negotiation and unleash chaos upon all involved parties. However, before he could speak, Jeannie intervened. Jeff, if you're absolutely certain about divorcing your wife and confident in your decision, what harm would it do to give her just an hour? In my view, you could shatter her hopes in just five minutes. But even if she's determined and it takes an hour, so what? You'll never have to deal with her again. Presented that way, it seemed like less of a big deal. Having resolved this issue, he decided to reconsider the offer and return to discuss it with a woman whom he called a woman of easy virtue. Jeannie handed him the written offer. It wasn't drafted as a formal legal document. Instead... It consisted of bullet points, serving as a framework for the legal language to be incorporated, agreed upon, and signed off on. Agreement between the agency and Mr. Jeff Smithers. In exchange for completing a mutually agreed non-disclosure version of this agreement, the agency will pay Mr. Smithers $5 million to compensate for the distress caused by a client and an employee of the agency. The agency offers this payment as a complete and final settlement of any claim arising from the aforementioned actions. The agency's client, referred to as Tim, acknowledges regret for drunkenly disclosing details of his affair with Mr. Smithers' wife. He unequivocally states he will not pursue any legal action regarding the physical altercation, conceding that he deserved at least what he received. Regarding Mr. Smithers' current wife, Cindy Smithers, the agency will retain her employment and provide compensation for her share of joint assets, enabling her financial independence without reliance on Jeff Smithers. Mrs. Smithers has agreed to cooperate in expediting a divorce based on irreconcilable differences, 
with the condition of being granted a maximum of one hour of Jeff Smithers' time to discuss the reasons for the divorce. This meeting must occur no later than two weeks before the scheduled court date for the divorce proceedings. It's not overly complicated, Jeff. We could all add layers to make it complex, but all parties understand the wisdom in avoiding unnecessary drama. The truth is there are no winners here except for you financially, although you've lost a wife. In a moment of clarity, Jeff realized he couldn't expect more than what was being offered. He didn't need advice. He even decided to agree to see her for up to an hour, but made it clear it wouldn't be a comfortable experience for her. He doubted she'd last more than 10 minutes and instructed them to tell her she could contact his office to schedule the meeting whenever she wanted to get it over with. Cindy attempted to see Jeff at his office but was denied entry. However, she was allowed to schedule an appointment via the intercom. Jeff informed her he would only grant the agreed-upon single meeting, no more, and she could take it or leave it. The following day, she arrived five minutes ahead of schedule, only to be kept waiting until 3 p.m. before being allowed in. She attempted to approach Jeff for a hug, but he swiftly halted her with a raised hand, spitting out, Don't lay a finger on me, you disgraceful wretch. Spit out your words and leave. His anger trembled through him. The foolish woman had been warned. Tears streaming down her face, she implored. Oh, Jeff, what have I done? Has your heart truly hardened so much against me that even a small display of affection is unbearable? We've shared nine years of love, Jeff. I'm your wife, I love you. Please, Jeff, I was a foolish girl infatuated with a movie star. I know my actions were wrong and selfish. Cindy, what do you expect to happen? I don't love you anymore. Didn't Peter convey my message to you? He relayed your words, hurtful as they were. But I believe deep down you still love me. We're meant to grow old together, Jeff. Cindy, are you out of your mind? You betrayed me in the most horrible way possible. You've been with him for months, even the day I saw you coming back from the beach and it took you 45 minutes to cross the road to our room. I'm not naive, Cindy. I know what happened between you, and then you came to me as if nothing had happened. You disgust me, Cindy, and I'm filing for divorce. Please, Jeff, I'm begging you. I made a mistake, but I love you with all my heart. Please give me another chance. This is your only chance, Cindy. Just tell the truth and let's see where it leads. Your gallant lover bragged to me about what happened in his bed. Something you never did to me. I want to know, so I'm going to ask and you're going to answer with a simple yes or no. Did you sleep with him at the beginning of the promotional tour? Yes, but I... Just a yes or no, no comment. Did you let him do things to you that you never did to me? Yes, she quickly admitted. But Jeff, he's famous and... I exploded. He's famous and attractive, so naturally you're willing to humiliate yourself for him, right? It all makes sense. If you lack any intelligence or self-respect... Is that what you've become, Cindy? A brainless puppet who allowed a celebrity to manipulate himself because of his fame? Do you understand that, Cindy? Loved is the past tense. Love is dead, gone, and will never come back. You disgust me, and you know what? You heard me tell him to leave you because I don't need you, and you heard him throw you away like trash, saying he could find someone like you anywhere. Do you understand? You mean nothing to him just a disposable toy that he can use and throw away. Jeff, this is unfair. You agreed to give me an hour to discuss our marriage, but all you're doing is yelling at me and acting. Something within me shattered, an intensity of rage and betrayal I had never known surged through me. I wanted to inflict pain upon her, to see her grasp the reality that our relationship was over. Yet, amidst the growing hatred, the poignant ache of love for her still pierced me creating a turmoil that felt capable of consuming me entirely. Get out. I despise you, I spat, seething with contempt. She sobbed, her anguish palpable, and fled through the door. Several months later, I encountered her again, this time at the courthouse. Her lawyer had reached out, claiming she accused me of shortchanging her during our allotted hour. She acknowledged the inevitability of our separation, but sought closure insisting on a chance to speak with me after the divorce proceedings. It seemed inconsequential, a mere half hour, but I relented. After all, once the divorce was finalized, there would be little left to discuss. 
Attending the final decree was the least I could do, though I felt I owed her nothing. It was simply a gesture to ease the path forward. In the months that followed, my anger faded away, replaced by a melancholic acceptance that something once so significant in my life now held little to no importance. There were moments when I drank excessively to numb the occasional pang of regret over ending things with her. A few close friends approached me about reconciliation, insisting we were great together and suggesting that starting a family might rekindle what we once had before Tim came between us. They pleaded with me to give her another chance, emphasizing how deeply she loved me, but it all felt like nonsense. I couldn't discern if they were genuinely concerned or simply acting on her behalf. Despite their apparent sincerity, their constant prodding only served to infuriate me. Eventually, I confided in a select few trusted friends, instructing them to ensure anyone mentioning Cindy would be swiftly removed from my life. And so, some of our closest friends distanced themselves from me, unable to tolerate the cold, callous person I'd become. So, months later, I found myself led into a side room at the courthouse where Cindy stood alone. She appeared as beautiful as ever, but those familiar with her, like myself, could discern the damage evident in her, just as it was in me. She was attired as if for a funeral, fittingly so, for this marked the funeral of our marriage. Its last rites had been administered, it was interred, all finalized and concluded. Now came the obligatory post-mortem conversation customary in times of mourning. We had quenched the animosity, or at least I had. She had extinguished the hope she once clung to. There remained nothing to dispute or contend over. So, hey Cindy, you're looking good. How have things been? I've had better times, Jeff. I've been seeing a therapist for a few months now. People said it would help, but honestly, losing my husband, the man I loved and still love, has made me realize how foolish I was to chase after a famous actor. I gave him what I never gave to my husband, the only person I've truly loved. It's too little, too late, Jeff. I'm deeply sorry for the pain I caused you. I wish I could undo it all and replace it with the love I still have for you, which will always be there in my heart. Jeff, I don't expect anything from you. I betrayed you, plain and simple. It's painful to realize that the man I thought was worthless now sees me the same way. But I made this mess, and I have to live with it. I wanted to see you one last time to make some kind of peace with you. I want you to know that I won't live a loveless life, but I'll always hold on to my love for you. If you ever realize its value and want it back, it'll be here for you. If you ever want it again, just ask. But I won't hold my breath. I know it's over between us, but that's the only way I can envision living my life now. I never questioned the sincerity behind her words. They resonated with truth. There would be no purpose in anything else. It would have been effortless to reach out to her, to attempt to rekindle our love, to heed the urging of our friends. Yet, I resisted. I understood that her employer still valued her, that she excelled at her job. In fact, she might be even more valuable now, unburdened by a husband. She would inevitably find herself in the same situation that led to her infidelity. We had no future together. With the anger dissipated, only the lingering ache of a love now dead remained. Despite this, I could afford to be magnanimous one last time. Cindy, I tell you this because it's hard to extinguish a love once so fervently held. For your own sake, let go of that love. I will never reciprocate it, nor do I desire it from you. Move forward with your life and don't dwell on me. Embrace who you are, and may you find happiness, Cindy. She approached me. And this time I couldn't push her away. We shared a tender embrace, reminiscent of the hugs Kusin's mighty Xiang. She softly uttered it, I'm truly sorry for what I did to us, Jeff. Then turned and slowly exited the room without looking back. It was perhaps for the best that she didn't glance back, as she would have witnessed tears streaming down my face uncontrollably. I realized that the love of my life had finally given up and departed. It was what I believed I wanted because I could never trust her again, but it felt as though someone had extinguished a flame in my heart, leaving behind a dark, cold, and desolate void. Perhaps it was time for me to heed the advice of my remaining friends and seek counseling to aid in my recovery. I had ultimately driven her away, 
dealt a fatal blow to our marriage, and crushed whatever remained, it was time to move forward. Five years have passed and my life has changed drastically. I've become not only the happy owner of a new house, but also the husband of a beautiful wife who has given me a wonderful son. Her name is Sophie, and we met her about six months after my official divorce when I withdrew into seclusion. During that time all my thoughts were consumed by one thing, a thirst for revenge. I understood that Tim, who played a significant role in the breakdown of my marriage, got off lightly, and his acknowledgement of his mistake and apology to me couldn't soothe my soul. Sophie was my lifeline. We met by chance, and soon we were dating for a year, until I proposed to her. Am I happy? Yes. Which is more than I can say for the people who destroyed my previous life. My ex-wife worked for a while, but then she got caught. She had an affair with one of her colleagues, and they got caught at the worst possible moment. Moreover, after she was given a second chance at work, she didn't perform her duties properly, so she was fired without remorse and left somewhere to the other end of the country. I don't know how she's doing, but judging by the fact that there's no news about her, it's probably not great. As for the actor, it seems to me that he began to lose his former popularity, because after he ruined my marriage, he managed to ruin several more marriages, leading to a real scandal. And if you believe some rumors, he's currently having serious health problems because one of the women he spent time with wasn't entirely clean. In the end, everyone got what they deserved, and karma did its job. Life goes on.